This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Cosmographia podcast with Randall Carlson. We are joined, as always, by Brad. Bradley, how are you doing this week, sir? Hello, gentlemen. Um, really, really quite great, actually, if I can elaborate. No taxes! Yeah. <laughs> yes. No taxes for the 15th, man. That is one of the few things that I hate. Never say I hate anything, but that's one of at least two things I know for sure, so. That feels good. That, that is true. It is a bonus. Mike, um, sir. Uh, everything's fine here. Thank you, guys. Going back to being silent. <laughs> <laughs> Mike does no comment. It's all you have to no say. No comment. There you go. <laughs> that cough, cough was perfect, though. Yeah. No, no comment. <laughs> oh, there, that, that would work, too. No comment. Yeah. <laughs> How are you okay. doing this week, Randall? Oh uh, yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, I've been doing, you know, actually real good ever since I had that stuff that I got from Mike <laughs> put me down. You know, we we actually recorded a couple of episodes where I was fighting that stuff off, and I know one of the episodes got a couple of comments like I was rambling off or something. There was a comment or two in there like that. And one of those episodes for sure was, you know, I was like, uh, <laughs> headache, body aches. I just wanted to be laying there sleeping with the covers over my head. Um, but hey, we did Dedication. It. Yeah, we did it. <laughs> yeah. But you so know, ever, a... ever since that, I've been feeling pretty damn good. All right, good. Is that is that a different comment? picture behind you there today randall than, that than last week's is hayukataki okay and hayukataki is very interesting comic because that came on right in the heels of hail bop so we had basically for a while there two comets in the sky hayukataki is interesting because we learned that at least in this case there were uh high amounts high concentrations of various flammable gases such as methane ethane and acetylene in the comet nucleus and that could possibly uh emerge to be relevant as we get further into our discussions of the effects of cometary incursions onto the terrestrial environment and perhaps the delivery pertinent. of absolutely volatile gases into the earth's atmosphere in addition to actual material stuff so Before right. we jump too far, I don't know how fast you want to get into things, but I, I am a little bit down in uh, Snake Bros. You're probably feeling a little bit of the same thing. Because tomorrow, if I was packed, I would be on the way driving to Zion yeah. Canyon. Yes. And that, sadly, contacted the cabin spring 2020 is not happening. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty bummed about that. And and. On the on the heels of that was also going to be Randall speaking in Sedona in mid May, which also is not going to happen. So yep. there's some frustrating things uh, going on right now that there's not allowing people to get out and get around and do the things that we want to be doing. But uh, that it yeah. hopefully is not restricting contact at the cabin, Carlson at the Scablands, September 2020. So. Still want people to be able to jump in there, and if they can go get involved and uh, contact contact Darren, we've got the links in the in the show notes, uh, the description for the video, and uh, let us know if you can go. Uh, see, make sure we got a full trip and possibly a second trip in uh, in late September. So, uh, Scablands, September, get out there in into the the flood zone with us. Yeah, yes, we we have reserved a resort with multiple cabins and buildings and a nice sizable uh, meeting meeting space, um, an attached restaurant, and it's right at the south end of Soap Lake. 
which is at the south end of Grand Coulee, and it's going to be a really great uh, point from which to explore the surrounding channeled Scabland complex in all of its bizarre wonder. Splendor. Um, all of its splendor. Yes, it's kind of, yeah, it's uh, Moses Cooley, Grand Cooley, um, Steptoe Butte. Yeah, all, all of these really incredible and wonderful places that um, will be part of, part of. Then, of course, there, there, there's going to have to be another episode that, uh, or another uh, field trip where we go into the lake basin itself right. um, and explore the uh, the landscapes there because we're going to on this one we're going to basically stop at the point of the of the supposed ice dam up near Pend Oreille. We I don't think we'll get any farther than that Lake Pend Oreille in northern Idaho. Right. Snake River, um, Potholes Cataract, um, oh the list goes on we will we will be posting an itinerary if we haven't already have we is there somewhere where there's an actual itinerary? there's a bare bones there's a basic one up itinerary. there with the with the contact at the cabin slash scab land hmm. site okay. uh, again that's that's linked in the in the description in the show notes uh people can look at that okay. but yeah we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna add randall's made a few and uh we're gonna continue on really getting details into exactly where people are gonna be getting to go over those five days yeah, but I, I I feel you on the being bummed out. We we also had a super secret expeditionary trip planned with George Howard and yeah. Ben from Uncharted X and Chris Cottrell from Dabbler's Den, and we were going to go do some super secret investigation, yeah. and that had to be canceled as well. So that was like last week, and then this week would have been Zion Canyon and Bryce, and that's also been rescheduled. So yeah, And also Comet Atlas just broke up into... Yeah. four different pieces so and yeah. they're thinking that uh maybe it's it's going to be going on the uh downhill side in terms of brightness fizzling so maybe yeah. We, yeah fizzing out which we discussed last week that you know yeah. sometimes that's just they, they they go all out and get huge but then that's a precursor to the just poof, breaking yeah. up poofing out and you know launching into yes but i so want maybe, maybe there'll be a be an explosion <laughs> off the sun we hope it's in the opposite direction but yeah we think it's probably still a pretty small nucleus yeah i want giant portents and omens in the sky though you know when they uh, yeah. fizzle out like this it ruins all of my you know nostradamus prognostications well what we're seeing <laughs> is one of the what i think of as <laughs> phase four in the life cycle of a comet which is disintegration and and this is very typical for comets, and it's the dis of comets that spawn meteor streams, fireballs, and also increases the possibility of encountering some of the debris. As long as you got a single comet nucleus, you know it's it can happen, but it's it's probabilistically speaking, it's it's rather low. But once a comet breaks up, one nucleus can become hundreds of thousands, if not millions of pieces that then become strewn out along the uh, cometary orbital path. And that's when encounter probabilities go up exponentially for the Earth. Now, most of the time, of course, you know, those encounters are with very small material that... Um, can produce quite a uh, an impressive light show, but wouldn't actually cause any damage. I mean, to get to the, get to get to, to surface damage, you have to be talking about between fifty and hundred feet in diameter, or otherwise it's going to pretty much uh, dissipate in in the atmosphere. It's going to dump all of its energy into the atmosphere, and there's been quite a number of um, meteoritic encounters with debris that is, say, on the scale of 20, 30, 40, 50 feet in diameter, it detonates in the upper atmosphere, and it's not unusual for some of those detonations to have the force of an atomic bomb. But, but when you're looking at those being 10, 10 miles up, of course, it usually just dissipates harmly in the, har harmlessly in the upper atmosphere. Are, are any of these comets, the ones we know about, big enough to generate something of the size you're talking about, 50 to 100? meters um oh hell yeah and it it could generate something as it as it goes by 
uh, and we would never know about it until too late. What we would have to do, now I'm not, I, and I haven't looked into it to this extent yet, but the intersection of Earth's orbit with the orbit of Atlas. And is there, orbits actually will precess, right? Due to gravitational perturbations of the sun and, the, and, and Jupiter primarily. But it, it's, it's, it's weird, but the whole orbital system almost acts as a unit in a way, and it can precess and move. And, and, and as it rotates, for example, there will be a perihelion where, it's, uh, where the orbit is passing closest to the sun. There'll be an aphelion where it's the farthest away from the sun. But as that's moving, see, then what'll happen is the stream for example, at perihelion, it might be fairly close to the sun. It might be inside the Earth. At aphelion, it's outside the Earth, obviously, right? But as that moves, it can, for, for certain periods of time, for certain epochs, the two orbital paths will intersect. So that is when the danger goes up, you see. Um, that's, that's what I was going to say. I, I haven't studied it intently, but I don't think that the plane of the orbit of Comet Atlas, you know, is going to allow much space for, for Earth's orbit to inter, intersect. It's going to be a very small yes, cross right. section, if, if any at all. If any at all, right. Like when we Because be of that, that processional cycle could cause it to eventually enter, or our, our orbital paths may one day cross. Is that what you're saying? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's possible. I, I can't say it's possible in this specific case because I haven't looked into it for Atlas, right? Yeah. But it is possible that, yes, a, 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 a meteorite orbital stream that doesn't intersect the Earth's orbit can... Um, can um, eventually. It, eventually, yeah, yeah. It can shift. And the other thing that can, it can you know, because typically the, the orbit of the of the meteor stream is going to be somewhat tilted to the plane of the ecliptic, which is the Earth's orbit. So as that rotates, there'll be a node po nodal points on two opposite sides. So in other words, picture, here's the Earth's orbit, and here's the orbit of the, I'll do it ex exaggerate, here's the orbit of the, of the cometary stream, right? So when the Earth obviously has to be here, at the same time, something is in the orbit, or there's, there's no encounter. But now the point is, is that if this shifts so that the, two, that the two aren't intersecting, then obviously there's no potential for an encounter. But the other thing in there, which we already talked about, is that a young meteor stream, it's not necessarily going to be uniformly distributed. There will be, there'll be um, areas where the material, where the concentration is denser. So when those regions where it's clumped or clustered, happen to be intersecting the Earth's orbit at the time the Earth's passing through that intersection, yes, obviously, then uh, the possibilities of an encounter are going to be enhanced significantly. So the first stage, you know, comets, I, I, I kind of find it convenient to think of, uh, of a cometary life cycle in, in, in terms of five stages. I call the first stage aggregation because this is where you have the first accretion of interstellar matter, the condensation of that, um, the integration of that material and its ejection from the solar system, the inner solar system. And this is of course, assuming the, the, um, you know, the, the planetary, the model of uh, solar system formation that sees, I guess you would call the nebular hypothesis where you have the consolidation of discrete chunks of matter that once they have gotten enough mass, you know, then it, it, it sets a, a process in motion because if you, if you collect enough material together, reducing the, the, the radial distance of that material, you begin to increase the gravitational attraction of other materials. So you put this process into motion, you get, you get one, chunk that's bigger than the rest, it'll almost like a magnet will start drawing stuff to it. As it draws stuff to it, you know, the gravitational force field gets that much greater. And it, it's a sort of a self-perpetuating process until most of the available material has been, has been um, 
you know, has, has been accreted to the, the planetary body. And then once you get enough mass and it overcomes the, um, you know, the internal structure of the material, what will happen is it becomes plastic and assumes the, the form of a sphere. Right, because a sphere takes the least amount of energy to support. So if you have the same, the same amount, the same mass of material in a sphere, for example, it's gonna take less energy to support that geometrical shape than if that same mass was in a cube or a tetrahedron or anything other than a sphere, right? So that's why the tendency is always towards becoming a sphere. So that's the, the idea of the nebular hypothesis. But, but in that, you see, because of the, the angular momentum, the spin, the material that is not accreted to planetary nuclei is basically thrown out. You know, picture this, if, if Jupiter is, is, is going around like this and group, Jupiter is a tremendous gravity, gravitational mass, and here comes a meteor. Now, Jupiter's in front of it. Right, and here comes the meteor behind it, moving at whatever velocity in its orbit. Right, typically, you have an object that's, that, as it reaches aphelion, it's going to be slowing down, and then it essentially makes aphelion and begins to fall back towards the sun. As it's falling towards the sun, it's speeding up, so it speeds up, swings around, makes its perihelion passage, and then goes back out. Well, as it's falling in, the sun's gravity is pulling it, right, accelerating it. Once it makes that passage. Now it's moving out. The sun's gravity field is, is tending to act as a braking force on it. We'll slow it down. Same thing with Jupiter. Comes out there. Now suppose Jupiter is here. The, the meteorite or, or the asteroid, the object is coming here. So what's going to happen is it's coming along. Jupiter then accelerates it. So what happens when it accelerates? It moves to a higher orbital shell. Or if the um, the force is strong enough, it'll essentially whiplash it right on out. Now, if you can look at the, the, uh, the difference if it's coming in, moving, and here's Ju it's coming in and crossing the, the Jovian plane. Here's Jupiter. It's now moving this way, but Jupiter's gravity is trying to pull it back and slow it down. So now it begins to fall into a tighter orbit. It's the radius of its orbit decreases. So Jupiter has a big role to play in, you know, bringing those cometary masses into the inner solar system where they can then break, break up and produce meteor streams. So in the first level, you have this aggregation level that, that is consolidating this material. And then through orbital mechanics, it is ejecting it out of the inner solar system where it then kind of goes into hibernation into the, um, theoretical Oort cloud or the Kuiper disk. Now, the Kuiper disk is, tends to be a flatter area of, of cometary, um, a cometary reservoir that's more or less in the plane of the ecliptic, and then the Oort cloud is a massive shell. These both, these were predicted, and according to the number of comets that have been coming in that are on parabolic orbits consistent with uh, an origin in the uh, Oort cloud, the plausibility of the theory is, is enhanced quite a bit because the comets are coming from somewhere. And based upon the, the, the known, the assumed density of the comets necessary to provide the flux, the observed flux into the uh, inner solar system, there have to be an awful lot of them out there. But they're so far out that they're basically in hibernation. They're sort of in a state of deep freeze. Now, they're just like the, the, the Kuiper disk is gonna be slowly orbiting the sun, right? And I think I got a graphic here that might actually show to help people visualize what it, what it actually, sort of what the models are looking like. Let's see here. Uh, so they, they're they orbiting and they're in a quasi-stable state. Well, what that means is that they can be perturbed. If they're perturbed, they'll change their orbital parameters. However, there's not a whole lot to perturb them out there, right? They're out there far away from any 
planetary bodies or any, um, you know, any sources of things that would, would perturb their orbits, except then we that have we know of that we know of. Right. So here we go. Here's uh, let's go this and let me do a screen share here and we'll have a look. Some of this stuff is retrograde too, which is interesting to me. These bodies are orbiting retrograde. Yeah. Well, this is a nice graphic by Calvin J. Hamilton. I've used this in my slideshows for a long time. And, and basically, this would be the sun that you see in the middle. Then you have the Oort cloud, which is this spherical um, array of clouds. And then the Kuiper disk is a flattened area where they're concentrated more or less along the planetary orbital plane of the, of the solar system. So here, here's another variation. You can see the upper box here shows the Kuiper belt and the outer solar system planetary orbits. And so the Kuiper belt is this disk of comets slowly rotating. Um, and it actually does reach inside the uh, orbit of, uh, of Pluto. Pluto uh, sort of more or less defines the inner zone of the Kuiper disk. Then in the and, and it's showing here, this arrow is pointing down, showing that the Kuiper disk is small relative to the Oort cloud. And this would be the inner solar system right down here where my cursor is. Um, and then the Oort cloud, as it says, comprising many billions of comets. So if the origin of the comet is from the Oort cloud, it's generally going to it's going to have a parabolic orbit. Remember, we discussed that last episode where a parabolic orbit is open, which means it's coming in, going out, and presumably never coming back. Whereas a closed orbit is a short period comet, and it's usually been captured from the Kuiper disk because it's orbiting more or less in the planetary uh, plane, which is you know the, the the ecliptic is defined by the a line drawn from the center of the earth to the center of the sun. And as the earth moves around the sun, that line would sweep out a plane that we call the plane of the ecliptic. Now, the, all of the planets in the solar system all fall very close to that, but their orbital planes are all slightly tilted a little bit compared to the earth's. But it's enough, I think that so that the maximum extent on each side of the plane of the ecliptic, I think, amounts to eight degrees, which means that the, the zodiacal band is then 16 degrees in width with the plane of the ecliptic at the center. And all of the planetary orbits will always, all of the planets in their orbits will always be found within that eight degrees above or eight degrees below the plane of the ecliptic which includes the moon, which is tilted at five degrees to the Earth's orbit. Isn't that Oort cloud system supposed to be like four light years in diameter too? Like it extends? Yeah, it's, it's huge. Like, right. yeah, that's about right. I mean, halfway to, you know, the Alpha nearest. Proxima, yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to stop share. And uh, so then getting back to the stages in the in the um, life cycle of a comet. So we go then to from hibernation where it's where it's in deep freeze. You could think of it that way. Now something has to perturb it. Something has to disturb it. What could that be? Well, speculatively, of course, I think that maybe a nearby supernova would be up to the job. Possibly a you know, in La Violette's model, a galactic core explosion, if that turns out to be plausible, uh, perhaps the a close passage of a stellar object of some kind. Um, all of these, of course, are going to be hypothetical. We just don't know. But there, there's potentially enough um, forces on, the, on, a, on a scale adequate to cause a perturbation in these reservoirs of comets. So, Basically, if they get jostled, what will happen is one of them will begin this long, slow, or multiple ones will begin long, slow um, descent into the inner solar system. You know, depending, again, uh, 
you know, if we're, if we're dealing with a, a, a nearby supernova explosion, you know, I, I'm not familiar with the f full mechanics of what would happen when they, when a super wave would pass through the Oort cloud. But in these models that, you know, I would certainly like to explore more to try to really come to an understanding of how this whole thing works. Nonetheless, there's something that perturbs these, uh, the reservoir of comets, jostles them. Some of them might move to a higher orbit. Some of them then might move to a lower orbit. Thing is, is they could begin to spiral from the Earth cloud. They could begin to spiral down into the plane of the ecliptic or, or into the, the plane of the Kuiper disk. From the inner zone of the Kuiper disk, they can actually be gravitationally perturbed by the outer planets, particularly Neptune and Uranus. Um, and, and in fact, it's possible that conjunctions of the outer planets, when they combine their gravitational fields, would be sufficient to perturb the um, comets in the inner zone of the Kuiper disk. So first we, so first we have the aggregation, right? The consolidation of these objects, their ejection from the inner solar system into the reservoir of comets. And of course, all of this is, is hypothetical, but a lot of good research supports that this model is, is more or less accurate. They go into their, 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 they are ejected out, they're into their um, respective reservoirs. They go into deep freeze because it's near absolute zero. Something perturbs them. So now if an object starts coming in towards the inner solar system, this is when the third stage kicks in and this would be activation where the comet um, undergoes an orbital transfer, a sunward journey. Once it gets within the, 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 the sphere of influence of the sun or even some of the planets, it can be, start outgassing, it'll form a tail, and then it'll begin its, its transformation into a devolatized, ultimately to a devolatized nuclei. Okay, then the next stage would be that the nucleus begins to undergo disintegration. And this would include vaporization of the icy matrix uh, and formation of, of meteor and dust streams after a sufficient number of successive orbits, right? Um, and then we get to the last stage, which I kind of think of as amal amalgamation, because this is where you now begin to have the, um, the uh, planetary, solar and planetary uh, encounters. Um, Plan, uh, encounters with not only the planets, but with the sun itself, which now seems to be the primary endpoint for a lot of comets that have come into the inner solar system as they fall into the sun. They form this, this um, a family of comets that is now known from about the last maybe 25 or 30 years called the, the sun grazing comets. Um, so now you get the planetary encounters um, and the, the solar encounters. So you then get Crater formation, if you have uh, enough, if the, if the mass of the material encountering a planet is great enough, you've got crater formation. You would have raw material injection into Earth's atmosphere, which can trigger a whole cascade of secondary effects, including climate changes and things such because of the fact that material entering the Earth's atmosphere can alter the opacity of the Earth's atmosphere um, and can become more reflective of solar energy impinging uh, upon the upper atmosphere. Um, so this material then can, can be injected into Earth's atmosphere. It can be taken up in the Earth's hydrosphere into the, um, which is the, the, the water level of the, of the uh, Earth, which includes, of course, the oceans, but all of the rivers and lakes and groundwater, which is, you could almost think of as a whole unified system of interlinked um, a, a water, basically. Uh, the lithosphere, which is the zone of rock, the biosphere, the zone of life. And as we're beginning to see now, it is, is a primary stimulus to uh, extinction and evolutionary cycles. Because it appears that encounters with cosmic material uh, have been associated with all five of the great extinctions. Only the Cretaceous tertiary of 66 million years ago has enough solid evidence to conclude conclusively that there was a, a cosmic encounter. But all of the other grade five also have enough evidence to suggest that, yeah, it, that there were encounters associated with the five great mass extinction 
the other four great mass extinction episodes in Earth history, and probably a lot of the lesser ones, because what we've been talking about for the last several episodes now is the Younger Dryas Boundary, which was the most recent mass extinction event in Earth history, and now the evidence for a cosmic encounter is, is pretty overwhelming. So when we get to um, the transfer of cometary masses from the Kuiper disk, say to the inner solar system where they can now become earth crossers is an interesting process in itself. And there was a, um, an article that showed up oh, back, oh, maybe in the nineties, even when the first, some of the first mathematics of, orbital transfer were being worked out with, with computer models. There was a, let's see if I can find it here. Okay, yeah. So this was published in Science News. Um, I don't have the year right here, easy enough to find it. Anyways, it's which was turned for this new study um, done by the Southwest Research Institute. I'll, um, so a new study reveals that the locations of the four large outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, right, play a crucial role in shepherding comets into the inner solar system from a layer beyond the orbit of Pluto. From Neptune to Uranus to Saturn to Jupiter, quote now, comets are being handed off from planet to planet, says Harold F. Levison of the Boulder Colorado Office of the Southwest Research Institute. It's this celestial bucket brigade, he notes, that allows a select group of comets to grace the skies above Earth, flaunting their dusty tails as they deliver key organic compounds into the atmosphere. If, now here's where it gets interesting because him and his colleagues worked out the mathematics of this orbital transfer and discovered, and I go back to the article now, that if this gang of four were spread further apart, comets that rank as frequent flyers to the inner solar system, visiting at least once every 60 years, could never make the journey. If the outer planets were bunched closer together, the orbits of these comets would look radically different. This speculation which may provide clues to the early lives of planets, stems from computer modeling developed by Levison and Martin J. Duncan of Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. They reported their findings in June at a comet workshop at the University of Toronto's Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics. With the existence of the Kuiper belt no longer in doubt, researchers, researchers have turned to another question. How do short period comets leave this storehouse and how do they venture into the inner solar system? A year ago, researchers provided the definitive answer to the first part of the riddle. In simplest terms, comets leave the belt because it has a slow leak. In 1995, Martin J. Duncan and Stuart M. Budd of Queen's University, along with Harold F. Levison, reported the results of the most extensive computer, computer simulation ever done of the Kuiper belt. Two kinds of orbits, characterized by their relationships to the orbit of Neptune, place members of the inner part of the belt in a precarious position, vulnerable to sudden chaotic changes in their motion. Kuiper belt denizens in these orbits stand a reasonable chance over a 10 million year interval of leaving the reservoir they call home. Some of the Kuiper belt escapees move away from the solar system. Others get flung inward toward Neptune. Once a comet falls into Neptune's gravitational clutches, the other large outer planets start to exert their own gravitational influence. In this way, some comets from the Kuiper belt make their way toward the inner solar system where they come alive in the sun's warmth. Yet the new calculations by Levison and Duncan show that one shouldn't take such a model for granted. And here's, here's the, the key part. It's only 
because Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, and Jupiter are spaced exactly far enough apart that each has a chance of handing off a comet to the next. Interesting, is it not? So what yeah. it's saying here is that the architecture of the solar system then is apparently exactly what it needs to be for this delivery of comets with their organic cargo into the inner solar system. So Brilliant. here we have another parameter that has to be considered when we start talking in terms of exobiology and what kind of planets might be harboring life forms. Because, is this, I, yeah, is Russ. This, is this uh, connected to the idea of Bode's law in any way? Like that these... That, that the planets are had this map. Well, I mean, it would distance. have to be. I mean, it yeah. would have to be. I, you know, because Bode's law does do a, a pretty darn good approximation of planetary right. spacing. Yeah, I've seen several that, others over the years yeah. um, that also do a pretty good job. Um, yeah. So, in any case, the point is, is as they are situated, we have this, as they're calling it, a celestial bucket brigade that now becomes possible. Sounds vaguely like mathematical creationism. Wait a second, Mike. We're not going there, buddy. <laughs> Look, when you start getting into this, uh, you know, hey, I think that that uh, all bets are open as to, you know, it's like Native American tribes looked out at the universe and they just referred to it as the great mystery. And, and, that's kind of where I'm coming from. It's, it is a profound mystery. How it got the way it is, I don't know. But it is the way it is, and it happens that the way it is is just the perfect way it has to be for us to be having this uh, Zoom meeting here tonight. Yeah, good cosmologists would agree. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's the great mystery. It is the great <laughs> mystery, right. But I have an observation, and this may be a little do. bit off the point, but I, I was thinking about if you have this sphere of, you know, comet objects or whatever, they all have to be orbiting the sun, right? This, the sun mm -hmm. is the center of gravity. So the ones that are in the Kuiper belt or the disk have to be going around it this way, and the ones that are out here in the Oort cloud have to be going this way. So they're going to they're gonna hit each other. If you imagine a, a bunch of particles in a sphere they, and they all have to be orbiting, they're all going to be crossing paths. Yeah, so, but the, the, the distances between them are so huge. But uh, there's so many billions of them that the it seems like there should be some level of inevitability that they will contact each other and maybe fall in. Well, I guess we need to know. get an astrophysicist uh, physicist on the show and get to the bottom of this. That'd be cool. The, yeah, other, the other thing I was thinking is... Uh, there were a couple of stories, um, I, I don't have them on me, or I don't remember where I read them, but it, fairly recently, within the last couple of years, there's been a lot of uh, observations about strange perturbations in orbits of the planets, where they're saying there is something else out there, mm -hmm. a large planetary body out there, whatever the name of it, you know, and, and they always make sure to say, it's not Nibiru. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but yeah, so maybe there is something Not Planet X. <laughs> far out there that has a really long orbit that may be moving these things around and flinging them around. Right. And quite frankly, that's not something I have an opinion on at this point, because I haven't studied into it to enough depth that I would proffer any opinion with any confidence other than to say that, yeah, I think that there are en enough yeah, I mean, there we can throw that in the mix, too. The fourth possibility of what kind of things could be perturbing the comets, ultimately, so that they end up out way, from way out there in the, in the sphere into the disk. What I was just showing you, or just, is just relating to you, is how that once they're in the disk and they, they, they migrate to the, the inner area of the inner region of the disk, they now become susceptible to these planetary forces, see? Whereas perhaps out there in the Oort cloud level, you know, we might be looking at interstellar or galactic forces. Right. Another possibility, um, you know, because the, um, 
the orbit of the solar system oscillates above and below the galactic plane. And I know that Michael Rampino and others have speculated that the, that the, the greatest concentration of, of galactic mass may be along the plane of the galaxy. And when our solar system crosses that, perhaps there is the potential for uh, perturbation. So I mean, there are there are a number of possibilities, and and we don't, have, and maybe it's more than one, you know. Um, yeah. See, that's that's really strange that that the entire solar system would be going up and down as it's going around. That makes it seem like there's actually something else that we're orbiting. It makes it look like we're going up and down as we go around, but it's because our entire solar system is is like in a binary system with something else. Well, we should talk about that uh, in an upcoming episode. Okay. I would like okay. to have prepare a little bit because I've got a lot of notes and some interesting possibilities there because there's actually traditions, you know, that, that go back that, that could be interpreted as referring to some kind of a subgalactic orbital center. But that would be okay. beyond the scope of, of tonight's discussion. I just did some, Sorry. I just did some quick math and assuming that, Oort cloud is four light years in diameter. Okay. I figured out the surface area of that sphere, which is enormous. And then if you put 10 billion comets in that surface area, you still have one comet every 117,900 miles square of area. So they're Fine. really far apart. <laughs> Not too many collisions, but occasionally you do see them where they're, you know, they look like a peanut, right? So it's like, yeah. Two objects kind of got stuck together. So you, you, you do have that, but they might not be opposing speed so high speed that they just obliterate each other. They may just stick together in the, in the icy matrix and then become one object. Yeah. Can you just put that in billiard terms? For me? <laughs> yeah, I just checked your scale, Russ, and yeah, you're you're pretty much in the ballpark. Oh, good. Thanks. I'm glad I'm glad I got it right. Yeah. Close. Four, four light years diameter would be the sort of the maximum. Right. That gives that gave me a sphere with a surface area of about 201 square light years. And then I went from there. Uh-huh. So, yeah. Square no, light years. Okay. Yes. Well, light year square is a lot of space. That's a lot yeah. of space. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's only two-dimensional. Real-time calculations by Russ. All right, so when we're talking about the delivery of material to the uh, to the Earth, one of the things we we were talking about last week was um, platinum, and you know, because platinum and iridium are two of the platinum group metals, and they are frequently associated with impact type events because they're very common um, in asteroids and meteorites, and possibly comets as well. And so we found that one of the discoveries is some of the studies we were looking at last week showed that, first of all, there was uh, a, a, a platinum spike found in the Greenland ice cores. And then that was followed up by a study of terrestrial sedimentary cores, which also discovered the existence of a platinum spike. Um, so we, oh, okay, we haven't yet talked about the, um, the studies showing that there is uh, the discovery of iridium and osmium also associated with the Younger Dryas boundary. But that's pretty convincing evidence that, you know, something of a cosmic nature did actually happen. And uh, so platinum, as it turns out, where we left it last week was possibly, according to some researchers, important to ancient peoples. That's where we left it off um, in that I quoted from a book uh, by Lawrence, the late Lawrence Gardner um, called Lost Secrets of the Sacred Ark. It was published in 2003. Um, and in there, you know, he's saying that correctly, that is generally cited that in encyclopedias and reference books, the, the platinum group metals, which for, for um, ease of, of talking about, we usually will just call the, the PGMs, the platinum group metals, came to our attention 
uh, in the 19th century, and perhaps the be of which the best known was palladium at the time. The palladium uh, was typically used by jewelers and alloyed with gold uh, to produce a metal popularly known as white gold. So it is said, quoting here now um, Lawrence Gardner, uh, that palladium was first discovered in Brazil, California, and the Urals, all three, in 1803. And it was named after the asteroid Pallas, right? Now look up, while I'm doing this, Kyle, you look up Pallas in Greek mythology. So iridium, osmium, and rhodium are also given the same date of recognition with ruthenium following in 1843. So then he says something very interesting. However, it is now plain from discoveries, and of course, this uh, requires independent verification, which is always important to do in, in good science. But he says, however, it is now plain from discoveries relating to the distant BC years that the ancients were fully aware of the individual properties of these platinum group metals. And in, uh, he had earlier discussed the iridium crystal um, and along with platinum, iridium, the other platinum group metals are palladium, rhodium, osmium, and ruthenium. Because of the ultimate strengths of the metals, they are now used in surgical, optical, and dental instruments, crucibles, thermocouples, machine bearings, electrical switch contacts, and all manner of precision devices down to the tipping of needles and pen nibs. Iridium crystal glows with a transparent color like any precious gemstone. The name iridium was applied in 1803 by virtue of ir its iridescence. And iridescence comes from the Latin iris, which means rainbow, right? So iridium is brought to earth by meteorites. It's an extraterrestrial metal and it can form its own glass-like rock. And some of this stuff is showing up in these impact boundaries, including the Younger Dryas boundary. Now, according to Lawrence Gardner, there was an ancient term called sapir or sapir, S-A-P-P-I-R, which was the term in the ancient uh, Middle East um, for this iridium crystal. Um, so he also makes a reference and suggests that perhaps some of the old Freemasons had traditions about this, um, which could, which is an interesting place to explore. And we could do that at some point once we've laid a good solid foundation of science. Iridium is a very rare element on earth, but geologists have discovered its existence in quantities up to 30 times greater than the norm in crustal layers where meteorites containing the substance have landed. And then he says, um, goes on to say, and again, this is all subject to independent verification, but he laid the groundwork before he passed away. I think he laid the groundwork for exploring this possibility and giving it more credibility. When he says that the Sumerians and the ancient Egyptians clearly knew about the properties of gold, and of how to ally it with other noble metals. And then he makes again another reference to Freemasonry and alchemical adepts who are also, he claims, familiar with the working of the PGMs, which just like gold could be taken to a higher vibratory state according to a lot of uh, references throughout the alchemical literature. Um, so, this opens up some rather impl interesting implications here if they did. And it's something that would be great to explore further. Um, this idea that, that um, platinum may have, uh, and the, the platinum group metals may have actually been worked by ancient peoples. Um, so the, one of the, the, the properties of, of the platinum group metals is that they uh, have high melting points and the ability to stay stable at high temperatures. Um, they have um, 
their oxidation and reduction properties uh, are such that they are extremely resistant to corrosion. Um, the industrial processes, as we've talked about a little bit, um, we find that they're um, widespread technological and commercial applications because of its unique chemical and physical properties. Um, but the interesting thing to me is that it's a catalyst or it's an ingredient for manufacturing processes. Um, consumer industrial items made with platinum and other, other PGMs include such items as flat panel monitors, glass fiber, medical tools, computer hard drives, nylon and razors, among others. Uh, automotive catalytic converter applications are the largest current users of PGMs and the demand is growing. Um, what else can we say about it? Uh, both platinum and palladium continue to be very rare and much of the world's platinum production comes from the small Western Bushveld, which is a 550 square mile, square kilometers that accounts for over 70% of the world's supply. So the Bushveld igneous complex is a, often referred to as a layered igneous intrusion within the, Earth's within the Earth's crust, which has been tilted and eroded and now outcrops around what appears to be the edge of a great geological basin located in South Africa. The Bushveld igneous complex contains some of the richest ore deposits on Earth. The reserves of platinum group metals, platinum, palladium, osmium, iridium, rhodium, and ruthenium are the world's largest. In addition, there are also vast quantities of iron, tin, chromium, titanium, and vanadium. Um, gabbro is a type of rock that is quarried from there. Gabbro is the host rock for, for these platinum group metals. And so the Bushveld, Likely, uh, I will sh do a share screen here, the, even going back to the 70s, we find the first evidence that the Bushveld was impact origin, which would explain why it is such a um, concentrated source of these precious metals. Now, it may turn out that a lot that these metals that are have various purposes, and we've talked about industrial and technological purposes. What interests me, especially though, is the idea of biological functions of these particular metals. But we see here this, this obvious correlation between, for example, in, impact structures and the presence of these unique metals. And let's see here. Ah, here we go. Are we still sharing? Yes. Can you see it here? See it? Yeah, we see it. Yeah, Look and that. that's actually the inner core of the thing. It really reaches out much bigger than that. It's and it's also what, what somewhat. Is this, what is this coloring? Is that false coloring or or natural satellite imaging? I imagine it's natural. It's been highly intensified and enhanced to bring out the features. You can see them much clearer. That's amazing. Yeah. So South African, so this is, is the world's richest source of these platinum group metals. Um, is that also one of the oldest impacts? I can't remember the age. It's old, that. yeah. I, yeah. Yeah, it, it's very old. Okay, well, you sent me down a serious rabbit hole over here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we like that. <laughs> We're we trying will. to figure it we out. We still see yeah. you. So, I looked up, uh, oh yeah, well the whole, the whole 10 by 10 by 10 tangent cube of science goes into the rabbit holes with us, so it wouldn't look <laughs> any different to you guys. <laughs> okay. But, um, so I looked up Pallas in Greek mythology, Greek mythology and I, I kept coming up with uh, Olympus. And reading about Olympus is very interesting. It's very, uh, sounds like the Kuiper belt or yep. something like that. Um, Immortal horses in the homes of the gods. Yeah, that come and go <laughs> as they please. And then we looked up the etymology of the word palace. And of course, it goes back to the Latin word palladium. If you look up palladium, which is spelled different in Greek mythology, the Latin is P-A-L-A-T-I-U-M. 
but in Greek mythology, mythology, it's Palladium, okay. P-A-L-L-A-D-I-U-M, which was... Uh, a wooden statue? Yes, a wooden statue that fell from heaven. And was kept at Troy, and for as long as it was preserved, the city was safe. And it is associated with Athena. Um, yeah, so... But I couldn't find... What are we looking exactly, for? Exactly. <laughs> I don't know. Did we do okay? No. <laughs> Okay, so it seems to suggest, what you found seems to suggest then there is certainly a cosmic association. Yes. Falls from heaven would. Now, that's interesting, see, because I just mentioned the biological implications of the injection of these metals, these catalytic metals into the Earth's biosphere. So now in the myth, we've got this association between wood Right, wood yep. that fell from heaven. Right. Now that's pretty bizarre. I, I see. It the reason is. I had you look it up is because I knew there was going to be some bizarre correlations <laughs> that showed up in there. Um, because I think one of the working premises that we're 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 exploring here is that there's evidence that peoples in ancient times had greater familiarity with some of these things than they've been given credit for. Yeah. Yeah. So going back to the biological implications, there's another study I ran across years ago when I was first exploring this that I thought may have relatively interesting implications and it needs further exploration. And I don't, won't claim to fully understand all of the implications of this, of this research. But this is going back to an article that appeared in Scientific American in 1995 and this is what they reported on um that there were um let's see oh here we go okay chemist thomas j mead and molecular biologist john f kayem have been exploring how electrons move in large molecules such processes underlie many important biological phenomena For instance, the conversion of sunlight into plant food by the magnesium chlorophyll model depends on stimulation of electron movement through the chlorophyll by the incoming protons. Mead and Kayam's molecule of study was DNA. They devised a way of binding atoms of ruthenium a platinum group metal, to ribose, one of the backbone components of the helical chains of DNA. Ruthenium atoms act like electrical conductors into and out of the molecule. They have the added virtue of neither disrupting nor distorting its overall shape, which, of course, is one of the characteristics of any catalytic um, substance or enzyme is that they that they can trigger a response a type of process without destroying or modifying the original substance right so ruthenium atoms act like electrical conductors connectors into and out of the molecule they have the added virtue of neither disrupting nor distorting its overall shape kyle while you're at it look up the word um um, um, say a catalyst. Look up catalyst. We'll go with that one. A, what is a catalyst? Let's define that before we move on. Okay, from I guess it's just the Google dictionary here. Probably, a substance that increases the rate of a chemical reaction without itself undergoing any permanent chemical change. There we go. Okay. Although there has been a long history of using such metals to understand DNA, the ruthenium ribose combination revealed something extraordinary. The researchers examined the electrical properties of short lengths of double helix DNA in which there was a ruthenium atom at each end of one of the strands. Mead and Kayam estimated from earlier studies that a short single strand of DNA ought to conduct up to 100 electrons per second. 
Imagine their astonishment when they measured the rate of flow along the ruthenium-doped double helix. The current was up by a factor of more than 10,000 times over a million electrons per second. It was as if the double helix was behaving like a piece of molecular wire. So what does that, I don't know, but it sure does seem to me that that is the entrance into a rabbit hole there that needs to be followed up on and looked at. And, and when I yeah. stumbled across <laughs> that, it, it, it really did confirm my suspicions that perhaps the PGMs did play a, a critical biological function um, in evolutionary processes. And so when you have impacts that not only cause mass extinctions, they're also injecting into the Earth's, uh, you know, atmosphere, lithosphere, hydrosphere, cryosphere, all of these exotic materials. The question is, is do those materials then have a biological effect? Is there a biological consequence to the um, to the enhancement of those materials into the into the terra sphere. I'll use the term terra sphere to encompass all of the the, the areas I just uh, just mentioned. And that's and impressive. and if there, sorry, if there is biological life in some cases within these objects that inject them into the planet, then they're sitting there in a soup of that stuff that is doing this kind of thing all the time. That's also interesting to me. Mm -hmm. So if they're not in stasis because of the cold or whatever, but if, you know, once they get close to the sun, they start warming up, things start happening, and all these metals are mixed in with all these uh, biological materials, then... Yeah. Maybe that's how we live uh, seven or 800 years. Yeah, there you go. Crank up that DNA. Well, Brad... In about an hour, you guys want to take a little break, or are you, are you about to launch into something new, Randall? No, a little break would be fine. Yeah, break would be would be good. Yeah, I'm gonna go have a ruthenium a ruthenium shake. Ponder, ponder Real that. Quick, uh, ponder that. Come back in advanced being. Yeah. <laughs> hey, we could start yeah. marketing ruthenium shakes. Yeah, man, we looked up the we looked up images of that metal. It looks awesome. Yeah. Well, you, when we get back, let's share those. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. All right. We'll be right back. Delivered in a crystal spaceship directly yes. to you. Yes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are back, and I uh, just wanted to share this uh, image of the ruthenium metal. Mm. Mm. Very, very Terminator-esque. Look at that. <laughs> yeah. That is really cool. So it looks like it has magical properties. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's magic. Yeah, I don't even know what I'm looking at. That's amazing. <laughs> well, what we should do is we should encapsulate some of it and then let Mike ingest some of it and then see if he <laughs> is still still normal afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> it's I'm not Alice. Bring him, it's bring not him acid, back. Randall. It's not Alice. Oh, it's not? <laughs> Sorry, Mike. Well, Bradley, pull up the um, the field ion microscope photograph of the iridium tipped needle. All right, I can get that back. Yeah, that that was uh, yeah, that's a pretty cool image, which we'll we'll come back to because the geometry inherent in that is quite remarkable. But that's through a light refraction um, using the field ion microscope, which was invented by um, what was his name, Ernest Muller. Um, Erwin, okay, let me see, Erwin Wil Wilhelm Mahler, who invented not only the field emission electron microscope, but also the field ion microscope. So he was considered to be the first person to ever saw an atom. And he took this photograph of a, of a uh, light being refract refracted from a tip, a very sharp tip of, a, 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 of an iridium needle. And it formed a very, and I have a color version 
should be. Oh, I yes. thought this was platinum. This is iridium. I think that one's, well, I think he did platinum and iridium. That one, I think that might be the platinum. This, okay. this one is the iridium. Let's see. If okay. Yeah. Can... Just, just from previous presentations, I had in my head that this was the platinum. Yeah. You might be so, right. Yeah, let's, that, see iridium. That could... let's see iridium. Cool. Yeah. So that really, that looks a lot like a cymatics pattern. I mean, doesn't uh, it? Yeah. If you look up the, you know, a Chaladni plate or something, you, that's very much what it looks oh, like. This is this is iridium. This uh, one is iridium. Yes, like electron electron scan or something. What what am I looking? Yeah, at? It, they excite it, and the electrons are emitted. Um, and as they're emitted, they form these patterns. Stunning. Yeah. Pretty Cosmic. remarkable. So, yeah, we're, we're going to come back because I've done an interesting analysis of this geometry, and it shows up in some rather, rather interesting places. So um, it, it would be worth coming back to that. So I um, wanted to talk a little bit about the um, Tunguska event, a little begin, begin talking about that because um, what we learned from the Tunguska event is going to shed light on the Younger Dryas event. Um, and there's been some really interesting new research in the last two years that we haven't uh, dived into yet about the Younger Dryas. Um, Excellent. Yeah. And uh, So the younger dryas, but you know, and the younger dryas, I feel, is so important to know about um, for multiple reasons. Obviously, because as we've talked about, you know, the the human presence on planet Earth goes back 150 to 200 thousand years, at least, right? At least, um, we're talking about a, from the um, study of skeletal remains. It would appear that that these people who were living 150 to 200,000 years ago were basically modern people. And assuming they had our cranial capacity, that's an awful long time. Um, and when we look at the last three to 5 million years, what is becoming apparent is that the, the younger driest boundary and the transition from the Pleistocene into the Holocene represents some of the most extreme and concentrated and rapid global changes recorded in the last three to five million years. The last, it's the greatest mass extinction event in at least that long. I would see the loss of species as being a direct, um, um, a direct measure of the severity of the event. And so I kind of look at that as sort of the dividing line between the two phases of human history, everything that preceded the Younger Dryas boundary events and everything that came after. Now, uh, when we're talking about the significance of that, you know, we're talking about the transition from a glacial age, a global glacial age into an interglacial age. And we're talking about during the global age, because of the prevailing cold climate, there was a drastic cooling of the ocean water. And once ocean water becomes cool, the solubility of carbon dioxide in the water becomes greater. And so what happens is there's a sort of a self-perpetuating feedback loop that can kick in where the cooling oceans start drawing down carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And some studies have suggested that carbon dioxide may have at times gotten under 200 parts per million, maybe as low as 180 parts per million. Well, you know, once it gets that low, what starts happening, photosynthesis starts shutting down. And a lot of the food crops uh, that are formed the basis of agriculture require more than 200 parts per million to be, to be effective, to grow effectively, right? So, there's some speculation then that really in the later phases of the ice age with carbon dioxide levels so low, 
it may not have really even been feasible to practice agriculture. Um, but what we do see is that agriculture um, begins to appear as a, uh, a, a, a social life way post Younger Dryas, right? Um, I'm going to quote here from Dr. Senta German, or German, who is an expert on Aegean Greek and ancient Near Eastern archaeology and art. She's now with the Ashmolean Museum of Art and Archaeology, and she wrote a, um, an essay for the, for the Khan Academy, which I think a lot of people are familiar with, a lot of, you know, um, interesting classes on many subjects in the, in the Khan Academy. So she wrote this essay called The Neolithic Revolution. This is what she said. We, the way we live today, settled in homes, close to other people in towns and cities, protected by laws, eating food grown on farms, and with leisure time to learn, explore, and event, and invent, is all a result of the Neolithic Revolution, which occurred, and here's her dates, from 11,500 to 5,000 years ago. Should be uh, a familiar date there, right? The earliest date. She's actually placing that right at the, the uh, inception of the Holocene, right? That's that date. That's the, we've correlated that uh, Meltwater Pulse 1B. We've shown that that date showed up in, in Plato's dialogues. We've shown that that date now represents the end of the Younger Dryas, the transition from the Younger Dryas. Um, period of cold into the what is called the uh, preboreal, which was um, the first really warming onset uh, of the Holocene. So at that point with the warming, a couple of things could happen. Number one, ocean starts outgassing CO2. And we see that CO2 levels start rising in the early Holocene, right? Well, now, as a result of that, it becomes more feasible to actually plant crops. So she said, goes on to say, the revolution which led to our way of life was the development of the technology needed to plant and harvest crops and to domesticate animals. So coming out of that Younger Dryas, we have the, um, the beginning of agriculture and the major domestication of animals. Was agriculture practiced? Pre-Younger Dryas, maybe, but it's very difficult to document specifically. Here were people living a settled lifestyle, growing crops. Because up until that time, if people are nomadic hunter-gatherers, right, you're pretty much on the move all the time. You, you've got to follow the game. Uh, you know, there's going to be seas major seasonal shifts where you have to basically keep on the move. Once you have agriculture, like she says here, then you can begin a more settled lifestyle. And as agriculture evolves, then you have enough food that everybody doesn't need to be a farmer. So that's when you get enough leisure time that people can begin to explore other avenues of activity, social activity. They can begin to invent things. They can begin all of the kinds of things that ultimately are going to lead to what we think of as civilization. Um, she goes on to say that Neolithic peoples did not have written language, at least not that we know of, um, because we don't see writing show up until about the fourth millennium BC in Sumer, right, which is in Mesopotamia. Uh, she says, we may never know the earliest example of writing, so which is absolutely true. However, there are scholars that believe that there was an earlier proto-writing developed during the Neolithic. Um, so most models of language, the spread of language, uh, at least as far as the origins of the Indo-European language family is concerned, associate it with the emigration of early Neolithic or Stone Age farmers out of the region of Anatolia, which is more or less modern day Turkey. And this would have occurred within the first few millennia of the Holocene Epoch. And it was during this time that we see the first urban complexes showing up. Ketol Hoyuk, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, Jericho, several other urban complexes, all within those first two millennia of the Holocene. Um, so we have, we have language dispersal, 
we have uh, farming uh, and agriculture, the domestication of animals, the first architecture. So we have all of these things showing up in like the first two millennia of the Holocene, coming right on the heels of the Younger Dryas. So the Younger Dryas is kind of like the backdrop to all of these um, prototypical activities that led to the rise of civilization three and four and 5,000 years later. And I look at it as, again, the dividing line between what we think of as, as the modern cycle of civilization that literally took four or 5,000 years. And I think one reason for that is, is that when we look at the early Holocene and possibly still today, one of the things that we'll notice is that like all, um, like if we look at seismic activity and volcanic activity, one of the things that's, that, that's um, particularly uh, associated with that are aftershocks. So oftentimes you might have an earthquake and then you will have a, a succession of uh, a crescendo of aftershocks of declining intensity. I think we see the same thing in the aftermath of the Younger Dryas is that we can see periods of, of instability and uh, periods of disruption that occurred right down to the beginning of what we think of as recorded history. And in fact, we're going to talk about that when we get into the to a more detailed breakdown of, of the 11,000 years of the Holocene. There was an episode at about 8,300 years ago where there was a sudden massive snap of global cold that might have lasted a few decades. The planet quickly recovered from that and went back into the to the planetary warmth of the so-called hypsothermal or climatic optimum. But that event would have been quite significant in terms of the, uh, the upward rise of human population and the, the global spread of agriculture, because that would have been a major interruption within that process. We find other episodes, you know, the Bronze Age, there's, there's, there's plenty of evidence now showing that there was um, very widespread upheavals during the end of the Bronze Age that would have uh, really tested the ability of civilization to endure. So we don't have a smooth, once the Younger Dryas is over, we do not have a smooth continuum for the uh, establishment of, of modern civilization. It was a bumpy road. And in fact, there are probably, as you know, we're getting into here, the idea that there are um, you know, still bumpy roads ahead of us, uh, for sure. Now, when we go back to the Tunguska object, what we're seeing there is what I think of as a, as a, a sort of a cosmic teaching episode. Because, you know, just like, um, say, Shoemaker Levy 9, um, the appearance of cosmic Hayu, Hay, comet Hayukataki, which taught us about the, really gave us insight into the volatile composition of, of cometary nuclei. We see that there's a, this, this um, these series of events from which we've really extracted a lot of insight and information into how these cosmic processes work. We're still reaping fruit from our studies of the Tunguska uh, event. Um, and I'm gonna pull up a quick, just to introduce people so they know a little bit better here. Um, you can kind of get a context here, a geographic context for understanding. We're gonna do a share, share screen. Uh, share. Okay, we'll pull up this map. Yeah, there we go. Siberia over here, like Baikal, is probably the um, geographic object that that is most useful for locating the Tunguska object. But here it is, right up here, um, in the Tunguska River Basin. Um, so just north of Baikal, and this is pretty much getting close to the northern limits of the boreal forests, which are the great, you know, the, the forests of, of the northern forests, right? If we zoom in here, um, we can see like here's the Tunguska River here, which it exploded very close to there. There was the, the Niz, Nizhnaya, Nizhnaya Tunguska here, and then near their convergence of these two, right here in this area is where the Tunguska explosion occurred. And this is the so-called butterfly pattern. And within this butterfly pattern, um, 
basically all the trees were mowed over and flattened out from a radial center. Let's see if I've got that um, here, if I have to show that. Uh, I think I've done a graphic that will help to visualize that. Yes, here we go. Um, so what I did here was because I was giving a lecture in Atlanta, I used a map of Atlanta and showing 285, which is about, if you look at this, this is, and a lot of the major cities have these perimeter highways. This is very close in size to the um, perimeter interstate that surrounds, say, Washington, D.C. It's about a 60-mile circumference. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say 100 kilometers, about 62 miles, yeah. Yeah, and the area within there is about 800 miles, square miles, roughly. So that means that this area here is very close in size to the butterfly, right? And so in the next image, what I'm going to do is I'm going to superimpose the butterfly over um, Atlanta. So you can actually see I've set the, um, the epicenter just over Buckhead. And it shows the splayed out radial pattern of the tree fall. And so this area right here at the epicenter would have been directly below the blast. We're talking about an atmospheric blast now, not an impact. The blast wave comes down, strikes the ground, and then moves laterally through the, you know, across the forest. It's also coming down obliquely. So the blast wave is just the pressure wave is knocking the trees over. Now these trees are about three feet in thickness. Um, we can go back up here to, oh, let's see. Yeah, we got some photographs here. Yeah, this is the probably the most famous and well-known of the photographs showing the forest knocked over. Now, a blast wave powerful enough to knock over a three foot tree is gonna knock most buildings over or at least cause severe damage. So you could picture that a Tunguska event, which has been estimated to be between about 10 and 20 megatons of energy is in the scale of a large hydrogen bomb. So a hydrogen bomb, say of 15 megatons, that was like, that was the largest hydrogen bomb ever tested um, by the US government back by the Department of Defense back in the day when we were doing atmospheric testing. Um, considerably smaller than the Soviet Union's Tsar Bomba, which was around 55 megatons, which was the biggest bomb ever detonated by, by humans, right? But 15 megatons is roughly equivalent to the explosion of Tunguska. And that would destroy any major city, one, one bomb. And so, when we kind of scroll through here, we'll see that, for example, if you look up on the hillside, you'll see that the, you know, there, are, there, are, there were millions of trees. I think the estimates were that there were maybe about 80 million trees that were, were flattened, right? And, but right under the epicenter, there was a ring of, of trees still standing with, with, that were bare, that had been stripped of branches and bark. And that was because the blast wave first coming down vertically didn't knock the trees over. It left this ring. And within that ring, everything was pretty much incinerated. I think there, of the 800 square miles, I think about 150 to 200 square miles under that epicenter was mostly incinerated. So this is what was seen over and over. So this was the ridge that was first witnessed by Leonid Kulik from the Kladni Ridge in the winter of 1927. So in this view, which is an old blurred photograph, but it kind of conveys a sense of the scale of the thing, the entire field of view was here decimated by the blast. And in 27, when Kula got there, it was beginning to regenerate. But his, uh, his impressions of what he saw were um, pretty interesting. Um, you know, he was he was actually disturbed by the level of destruction that that he saw. This is this is um, in fact, here, here's a quote that he said. Here, here's what he wrote in his diary. I still cannot sort out my chaotic impressions of this excursion. 
From our observation point, no sign of forest can be seen for everything has been devastated and burned. One has an uncanny feeling when one sees 20 inch to 30 inch thick giant trees snapped across like twigs and their tops hurled many meters away. The results of even a cursory examination exceeded all details of the eyewitnesses and my wildest expectations. So that was Kulik's first impression. And I've often thought that when you read the whole story of Kulik making these heroic efforts to get to that site, um, it would be it would be worth making a, a, a movie of it, some kind of a, a movie, because the story is really quite remarkable. And and the the um, you know the the what he had to endure to get there, because there was you know there were no roads there. They had to go by um, they had to go river. They had to drag boats over land, um, and they really had to battle the elements. And they only had a very narrow window, seasonal window that they could get in there. And um, yeah, so it's a it's a it's a heck of a story. Um, let's see here. Okay, so here is what's called the swamp, and this this is ground zero, and there's not much happening there because everything has been pretty much obliterated. Now you notice the vertical trees standing here. That's just outside. It's like a ring just outside this epicenter of extraordinarily intense heat and pressure. In fact, some estimates are that the, the heat might've been equivalent to the uh, temperature of the photosphere of the sun for a very short period of time. So let's see here. And then this is an old photograph, but this, this might have um, relevance when we come to talk about the Carolina Bays. One of the, and this is a picture of one of the many oval, oval crater swamps Kulik found near the epicenter. And then I'm saying there, note the forest devastation on the hill in the background. And this is what they're calling the cauldron. So this was, again, associated with the epicenter. Now, this is in the 1980s, so it's had, you know, three quarters of a century to begin recovering. Once the Cold War was over in the early 90s and American scientists got to start accessing Soviet uh, research, very interesting uh, studies that begin coming out on some of the um, genetic anomalies associated with the Tunguska um, event, and, and that we, we can explore. Let's see here, there's one. Yeah, now check this out. So here's a photograph of one of the small, neat oval bogs that Kulik erroneously presumed to be secondary craters of a fragmented meteorite. This one was named after the ethnographer Suslov. Well, look at this thing. I mean, what we're seeing here resembles a fair, uh, Carolina Bay. And why does it say? Yeah, it why does it say erroneously presumed? Because they didn't find any actual chunks of a meteorite in it. See, the original assumption was, oh, these bogs, a meteorite struck there and created this elliptical depression. But then, like they, they like the Suslov hole, they drained that completely, excavated it, did not find any remnants, any macro scale remnants of a meteorite, of a fragmented meteorite. That's why they're saying erroneously. In other words, a secondary crater. So the th thing explodes, pieces of chunks of the thing come down, strike the earth. Then, so they assume that if they excavated in there, they would find this secondary chunk. They didn't. About time to wrap it up, Randall. Yep. And here, here, the photograph of crater swamps found in the area beneath the epicenter of the blast. Notice it, the, the photograph is pretty crappy because it's an old, old photograph. But notice you've got these elliptical depressions here, right? Yeah, that is interesting. And here's one of Cauldrons. the more recent <laughs> oval bogs. 
raised rim. So we'll look at these again when we come back and start talking about Carolina Bays. Yeah, um, definitely. So yeah, I guess we can we can uh, stop for now. All right, good. Just good so next week we're gonna next week we keep going on that that angle. Sure. Excellent. Yeah, and then tie in. We're gonna tie in some of the things we've learned and some of the the correlations between Tunguska and Younger Dryas. All right. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, everybody can get a hold of us, cosmographia1618 at gmail.com. And of course, all this is in the show notes. Links are in the show notes, website links, uh, other podcast links. If Brad puts up, sometimes you put papers in there too, right, Brad? Definitely. Uh, a couple came to mind during tonight's show, so we'll add some different links for there. Yeah, people can uh, go down their own rabbit hole. We create for them. Yes. <laughs> and take all your friends with you. Yeah, we'll we'll do the excavating and you just do the diving in. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> also, links for anybody interested in the Scablands trip will be down in the show notes. And um, anything else? Well, I, Brad, what's going on with the video channels? Uh, Lost coming fast and furious here to catch up so they're all gonna they're all gonna be there on the randall carlson channel soon so uh, a lot of people talking like they're starting new which is great a lot of people just yep. sticking around uh, that came on new with the the newer channel uh are doing them in sequence and holding off on these brand new ones so they'll have plenty of uh content to come for months and uh so so yeah just uh uh keeping up with it and uh, a lot of a lot of great comments coming in and uh we appreciate appreciate everybody that's uh, that's here with us now as we're doing it live. Yeah, and I want to say thanks to all the people that have stayed on board and continue to support us through these uh, trying times. Yes, Wh which For we're sure. going to get and through. We are, no doubt, we are because yeah, we got bigger fish to fry. That's right, and there are links for anybody interested. There are links for the support. Uh, Patreon and PayPal links are in the show notes as well. So right. we appreciate very much everybody who has been supporting us. And I still see those Patreon, new Patreon supporters coming in Sweet. Uh, almost every day. Very so consistently. Yeah. Excellent. Well, we're, awesome. we're, yeah. we're, we've got, we're talking about doing a, hosting a live stream at some point for Patreon yep. members. So let's, right. let's get that in the works, guys. We, we got okay. quite a few uh, nice perks coming up. Uh, it's you got to get permission from getting, Mike. Getting the first. time and the and the people to implement it all. Um, <laughs> bringing out new stuff right. all the time, and uh, we're, we're getting better and better. Appreciate everybody's That's hard right. work and, uh, like you guys said, the patience sticking with us uh, as we grow here. Yeah, and and yeah, we'll we'll check with Mike. You know, for those who are wondering, yes, Mike is our um, contact. He's our agent from the deep state. So that's right. That's how we keep our pulse on what's going on. <laughs> that's right he allows us to do this podcast he's here to make sure that nobody gets out of line yeah uh, that we stay yeah that we don't start yeah. revealing too much classified information all at once that's right <laughs> who do you think's on the other side of those blinds <laughs> <laughs> this is master control <laughs> all right guys this is a great show Beautiful. thank you very much see you next week Guys, good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks again.